This is from Vijas, T H I J S. How have you pronounced that? Vijas. Do you see? Uh, it's it's Thais. It's Thais. Oh, is that is that Dutch? It's a Dutch name, yeah. What's the J? Yeah, Thais. Where, where's the J? Yeah, no, it's it's a, it's a Y. Thais. It's okay. a beautiful Dutch uh, language. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the F1 Feeder Series podcast, your guide to keeping up to date on everything in the junior single-seater world. I'm your host, Jim Kimberley, and welcome back to the podcast after we took a one-week break to catch our breath. And it was a curious break where a certain F1 Feeder Series founder set Twitter alight by asking what guests our followers would like to join the podcast. The response was incredible, not only from fans, but also many drivers we've booked in and we've got some great names for today and the coming weeks. But one driver in particular started the fire by only, by only committing to join us if his tweet had 500 likes. Well, 500 likes were quickly given, and they also powered this race-winning F2 driver to end a dry run by scoring points in Baku. Welcome to the podcast, Richard Vashore. How are you doing today after your P5 finish? <laughs> Hi, guys. Um, very nice to be here, first of all. Uh, I think uh, Flores wanted want me on the podcast for a while. Uh, and I think it's nice. <laughs> also, it, it, it's good to see your fan base growing so much. So I'm happy, I'm happy to join. Well, thank you for joining. And uh, 500 likes, 5 P5 in the race. So coincidence, <laughs> I think not. We had a little bit to do with that. So I, sh I should have asked for 1,000 likes. So I got two. <laughs> <Yeah>, exactly. <laughs> next, <laughs> next time, next time, you'd know. We'll speak about the race in a little second. There were no tweets necessary for our second guest, who is a driver we've been trying to get on behind the scenes since we started the podcast, but he's a lot busier than I was at 16, having raced in four F4 championships this year, plus some Porsche fun too. He's taken podiums in Italian and ADAC F4, won the F4 UAE title. Welcome, Charlie Verts. We finally grabbed you on a weekend when you weren't in a race car. Hi, guys. Uh, yeah, thank you for letting me join the podcast. I mean, um, yeah, I'm quite busy, but uh, so I missed the last podcast, but luckily I could join this time. So, so thank you for inviting me and yeah. Thank you for joining. That's the big one for us. But I'm afraid, Richard, I'm afraid, Charlie, it's the headline guest that people have been waiting too long for that I'm introducing now. Ending any rumours that he's gone into hiding, doesn't like racing anymore, or God forbid, lost his lovely hairdo. F1 Feeder Series founder Floris Vismund is back on the podcast after. I don't know how long it's been, Floris. Did we just need to have a Dutch driver to reel you back in this whole time? Yeah, you know, um, I always support Dutch drivers extra. I'm, uh, you know, <laughs> maybe it's not the smartest thing to say as, you know, as a chief editor of a feeder series <laughs> platform, but uh, Dutch drivers always uh, uh, have, uh, always, always have um, uh, an extra step for me, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so that helped. Um, and also, uh, you know, I just want to give our, our uh, other editors, you know, a chance to, uh, to join the podcast. I don't want to do them all myself. And, uh, you know, they're awesome. They do great. They really do. It'd be good in your place. But any idea that F1 Feeder Series has objective journalism has just gone straight out of the window. It's a Dutch yeah. fan site. And yeah. Richard Vashore is the greatest driver of all time, which we already <laughs> knew, Richard. And Charlie's good <laughs> as well. But now we've had confirmation from our founder. Before we get into it, a quick reminder to like, comment, and subscribe if you're watching on YouTube. And we're delighted to say we're already pushing towards the 1,000 subscriber milestone and every single sub is welcome. It hasn't been long and we're already there. Thank you, everybody who's already subscribed. And if you're listening to the audio-only version, please leave a review on whatever podcast platform you're using. We're sitting with five stars on Apple Podcasts and a 4.6 star rating on Spotify right now. Thank you to everyone who leaves a review. It really does help us out. Okay, so we have to start with Formula 2 at what is always an unpredictable race, Baku. Let me go first to a man who had to drive the crazy circuit for three days. You felt the pain of a crash on Saturday, but the delights of points on Sunday. Let's start with the good side first, Richard. 
your first points finished since your Jeddah podium and you rocketed through the feature race. Uh, I was watching your, because I knew you were coming on the podcast, I was watching you on the timing tower and you like last place before one of the safety cars. How the hell did you get to P5? Yeah, very good question. I'm still asking myself now. <laughs> to be honest, it was a big, big shame because uh, we were quite fast on the option tire the first um, five, six uh, laps, even after safety car. And then I had a really good pit entry. I was right behind uh, Dennis Hauger. He jumped uh, Liam Lawson in the end. But then I stalled in the in the pit lane. Oh. So it was fully my mistake. Uh, I just wanted to go too badly and the, the lollipop didn't go up yet. So it was, was definitely to blame on myself. And then we were P last. And uh, I was like, I felt so bad also for the team because the day before I threw away the podium as well. So... Then uh, in the end, I was very, very happy to end up on P5 to, to get some points because we really, really needed some. Um, but it was a crazy race in the end. I had a really good opening lap uh, after the safety car, let's say. So, yeah, it was crazy. But it was, was good fun. Now, you say about the stalling thing as well. Do you think it could have been a podium possibly had you not stalled? I don't know what the gap was. The TV cameras weren't focusing on, on no, you at I that think, point. I, I think I threw away a win. A win? Uh, a win or a second, yeah. Because uh, it was a high chance we would have come out before Liam Lawson mm -hmm. and then we would have been behind Dennis. He was very fast. Of course, you don't know what would have happened. Maybe Armstrong didn't crash into Vips. Maybe Vips didn't crash at all. You know, you never know what would have happened because in the end, Liam didn't finish as well. So it's also possible that I had a crash, you know. So in the end, we should be very happy with B5. Yeah, well, I'm just, I bet you're just quite happy to end that streak of pointless, pointless, two separate words, not pointless, to pointless <laughs> finishes. It's been a little while since that podium, but you weren't the only driver, like you mentioned with Vips there, to find the wall on the weekend. Vips crashed out, got pole position, so clearly he had speed. Feature race with a Hauger crashed out in the sprint race. Is it the safety cars that ruin any hopes you have of having concentration? Is that the reason why people end up no, falling off definitely. the track? Definitely. For me, in my point of view, um, so on the sprint race, the the safety car where Fittipaldi crashed uh, in turn three or turn two, the car was already like outside of the track completely, fully at the end. So this is clearly a VSC. I mean, there's no reason to put a safety car out when there's no car on the track hmm. so i think i just wanted to play it safe but in the end in baku safety car is a lot less safe than a vsc which we witnessed in the future race so for me that one was totally unnecessary that's also why it went wrong for me uh, i mean i was uh, in the end i crashed into the wall uh, in a fight with Li liam lawson uh, but yeah the, the safety cars are, are sensational but very dangerous Loris, it's been a good while since your last podcast, but I know you've been keeping up to date on everything. We saw two F2 rookies take wins this weekend. That's the first time that's happened this year. Logan Sargent also grabbed P2 on Sunday. Are the newcomers finally finding their feet as we approach the halfway point of the season? You no, know, it's, it's funny that you mentioned uh, uh, Sargent because I thought he was really... Um, uh, nobody really talked about him last weekend, uh, but he had a super... Uh, a consistent, um, uh, consistent weekend and actually a pretty consistent, um, season up till now. But he's like, for me, it feels like he's the, the exception to the rookies this year because the rookies all had, you know, uh, for one reason or another, maybe a pretty rough start, like Hauger, um, uh, like Festi, of course, and they both drive for uh, top teams in F2. Um, but they, they didn't score a lot of points, uh, but now, just now, just the last couple of rounds, they're coming into their own, and uh, Hauger now has two wins in, in, in four races, I think, Vesti got his first win, so, you know, it, it, it can't always be the same every, every year, like last year you had, uh, and Richard knows, uh, you had Piastri, and he was like almost on the pace from like the first round, of course, it helps when you have a good team, but um, you know, uh, some drivers take a little bit longer to to ease into like a higher category or you know uh, a new team or whatever. But you know, it doesn't doesn't mean that um, let's say the new crop of rookies is is like not as good. 
Vesti got the podium as well. I don't know if it's like a confidence building thing or something, maybe. Maybe you can shed light on this, Richard. Just getting the first good results in will accelerate you for the season for these for these rookies. Well, the thing is, the car is also quite different to drive compared to the F3 cars where they're coming from. So the car's a lot heavier, different tires. Uh, there's a lot more to think about. Also, the start with the clutch map, the throttle map. So I think it's quite a decent step from Formula 3 and mainly that the car is, is heavier and with the different tires it's just different to drive it's a different way of pushing the car to the limit and then also in the race the, the tire deck is so much more than uh, than a Formula 3 so you really have to like if you lock up two or three times basically you're already on the edge of you know destroying your tires so it's it's very difficult to drive on the limit but not destroy the tires. So how many lockups as well with these horrible well, I don't know horrible, you maybe think differently, but these 90 degree corners all over the place in Baku. Charlie, F2 is heading for a busy July with four rounds, eight races, all in one month. You're getting used to such a hectic schedule after your year. Is it as crazy as it seems from the outside, doing all this traveling, doing all this racing? Are these Formula 2 drivers going to be absolutely exhausted come the summer break? I mean, for me, you know, in the past two months, I think I've been had a race weekend every single weekend except the last one so it was my first weekend off and um i mean i think in may i had 30 minutes at home <laughs> just to stop and get some a new suitcase to go back to a new new track so so it's been difficult and i'm sure for the f2 drivers who have to travel even further to different continents and stuff must not be easy but um i guess we all love the sport so i guess that's how we do it well, we look at it from the fans' perspective, and I'm covering this, fortunately, from my living room at the moment. Um, so I switch on, and you drivers are already there. But, of course, when you're lining up on the grid, both of you, Charlie, Richard, you guys have been well, there for practice, there for the press days, traveling there, eating, sleeping, checking to hotels and everything. How exhausting, Charlie, is that for you outside of the car? I mean, I think it's important to just, if you have any time to relax, just make sure you relax. If you'll have like a double race weekend or something, just make sure you can get enough time to rest and early sleeps, good food to eat. And all that is actually quite important just to make sure you're ready for the race weekends. Any top tips, Richard, that Charlie can uh, pick up on from somebody who's been doing it for a little bit, bit longer? Yeah, don't take flights during the night. This is the worst thing. <laughs> I'm on a budget, so I need to save up somewhere. But uh, no, that's the worst thing. If you have a flight overnight or whatever, you're very tired the days after. Yeah, well, a little bit of a back story for that as well. Richard was telling us before the podcast started, he's, he wants to sleep rather than be on the podcast. Well, not as you be on the podcast, you just want to sleep as your main focus right now. You're a very tired guy. Exactly. Bless you. But let's focus back on F2 for a second. And thinking on the season as a whole, this is for you, Richard. Drogovic and arguably Daruvula are the only drivers with consistency every round. I mean, Daruvula has been racking up podiums, even, not the, even though he's not got the wins yet. And we've seen Lawson and Vips shine, and now they're fading a little bit. Hauger and Vesti have emerged from nowhere, it seems. Fittipaldi too. Tried, it seems, to have pace and then sometimes be anonymous. What's going on this season? Is it just... Going back to the old four, well, the, the, the two race format is making things ebb and flow a little bit more. What, what's changed? Um, no, I think actually we are very strong this season. Um, much stronger than most people expected, I think, as well. Um, but the thing is that in Imola, we had quite a big mistake in qualifying uh, in the rain on the dry track. Then in Barcelona, something very weird happened to, to the car because we were really, really off pace. And even in the races, we were, there was no pace at all. While in the preseason testing, we were actually always top five. And then Monaco, the car broke down in qualifying. So to be honest, we just had three extremely bad weekends, also like with zero luck. Um, Monaco, I think, honestly, we, we could have been on the podium there because we were flying out there. And... Um, it's just a big shame because I didn't score points for seven rounds, which is a lot. Um, I, I lost so much space also to the leader. And I, as you said, uh, uh, consistency is key uh, in this championship. And that's something that Felipe has done extremely well so far, especially, of course, with his two wins in Barcelona. And that was 
amazing. Um, so yeah, that's definitely, we were lacking that for now. Charlie, you watching this weekend, have you managed to keep up to date on Formula 2 as a whole through the season? Have you been mightily impressed with Felipe Drogovic, who, by the way, somehow ended up on the podium again this week? I don't know how yeah. that even happened. I was watching the race and I was like, and who's in for Drogovic? How the hell? Are you impressed with Mr. Felipe? Do you think he's going to be looking at the title? Yeah, I've been watching, I think, all the F2 races and it's been quite entertaining. Um, so much overtaking, I think, a bit more than F1. And it's just fun to watch. And I, I mean, like in Baku with the safety car restarts, I think it's not as fun as a driver because it was always chaotic. But as a spectator, it was really fun to watch because you knew anything could happen. So I think it was really, it's really entertaining, but maybe not as entertaining in the car when you, like in Baku, where you could like have an instant really easily after safety car restart. Yeah, um, as Richard sadly knows about. Just final bits on F2. This one goes for you, Floris, and I feel a bit like a gossiping granny going into this. There's some post-race drama after Baku. Team Bolkbassi and Team Nasani got into trouble after some physical alterations, and then Amari Cordiel is going to miss out on Silverstone after racking up penalty points. Not much we can add about the fisticuff side, but what can you tell us about the Cordiel situation, Floris? Well, you know, it looks like he has, you know, not enough experience for F2 just just yet, you know. Uh, I wouldn't say he's a terrible driver. Um, he's just maybe a bit too light. Um, and, you know, those penalty points came in really quick, like 12 mm -hmm. points after, what is it, six six rounds, maybe? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, that's that that's crazy, you know. Um, and, and, you know, uh, Van Amersfoort Sport Racing has to look for, like, for a new driver now because... Uh, you're kind of forced by the rules to uh, to fill two seats uh, or both seats. Um, so they'll be looking, you know, the first thoughts of people always go to, oh, but they also have an, have an F3 te uh, team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but they're also doing Silverstone. So that's not possible. Uh, they also have uh, Formula Regional. Um, but I think those drivers are still a little bit too light for F2. I, I think they will take Ben, ben Fiskow or David Blackman. Yeah, we, we, we talked to uh, uh, someone who knows, who works with Ben, uh, and he says, of course, uh, they can always arrange something, but he's also driving on the same weekend, I think. Ah, then, then they will not. Well, what about nah, this Richard yeah, Vashore? He jumped into a seat last year when somebody needed him, went into Shabru <laughs> all of a sudden. That guy might do something. No, I'm sorted, so I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're, tr you're trying to make headlines here, Jim. That's not fair. <laughs> No, but in all seriousness now, it's, that has put them into a bit of a difficult spot because they have to fill that for, for the Silverson round, like you say, and it's not a quiet weekend, like you're suggesting. Even, even W Series is joining Formula One again on that week. It's just so busy. That's, so. that's true, but, but, I, but I think the, the positive thing is um, since um, uh, he's a little bit you know, inexperienced and he's, not, he's had a really tough season, they can put in a driver. I don't know how it works. Maybe they'll give it to the highest bidder, but they can put in a driver that has a little bit more experience, you know, someone like uh, Beckman or Zendeli or whatever, or maybe even Nanini, you know, uh, if they, if they uh, have the cash, of course. Um, but then they have uh, more chance to score points. Hmm. Charlie, you're probably busy because you're always racing every weekend, but do you want to make the step up into Van Amersfoort? We can make the negotiations happen right now. Uh, yeah, I definitely wouldn't mind driving Formula 2. So... If they wouldn't, if they would want to give me a call, I'll be happy to answer. There you go. There's your exclusive. There's the headlines, Floris. We've got it sorted now. Charlie Burton. Is it confirmed. actually maybe maybe Richard knows? But is there a, a minimum age for a driving F two? I don't think so. No. no. Okay. I think I think that the, also physically, it's not that easy to, you know, especially Silverstone is going to be so tough. So, uh, but let's see. I mean. Uh, I already drove F2 a test when I was 17 as well, so it's, it's always possible. True. There you go. Yeah. Charlie Verts, confirmed Silverson winner, going to take the championship away from Felipe Drogovic. You heard it here first, everybody. Now, what I'd usually do is switch focus to the other racing of the weekend, but it seems that Baku and a weird French event about 24 lemons or something took most of <laughs> the attention this weekend. So we're going to move on to the part of the podcast where our viewers and listeners have their say with hashtag AskF1FS. 
If this is your first time watching or listening, you can get involved by using the hashtag AskF1FS on Twitter, joining our Discord and using the podcast questions channel, or simply commenting on our YouTube videos and asking whatever it is that's on your mind. I will have to say now that Richard and Charlie are really bloody popular and we've been bombarded with questions, so we apologise if your question isn't going to get asked this week. But let's start with this one from Adrian King on Twitter, who wants to say, please can you ask Richard if Max's success has made it easier or harder for Dutch drivers to access cash funds for their career? Last year, I remember I said that it didn't make any difference um, because of my experience talking to companies. But this year, this season, so actually I have to say two years ago and last year, because I started talking to companies last year, uh, it has been a lot easier. Uh, maybe it also helps that I won in Silverstone and people are watching more Formula 2, but that's also because of Max. So I'm pretty sure that it does help. And the sport in general is so much more popular. So I don't think even only for Dutch people, but for any racing driver that is trying to get there. Um, I think companies are much more interested. I think also the value for the companies is is getting much higher because there's so many more people watching and willing to attend to the race. So I think actually that the, we should thank him for that. I'll say this, and you might not know, because Max is... Well, I would say ascent to the top now. He's been at the top for a while, but actually been a champion. That's kind of coincided with this drive to survive era, let's say, and Formula One really pushing the social channels online and things like that. Do you think it's difficult to actually unpick? And they're saying this as a Dutch driver here, but to unpick what it is that's actually helped? Is it Formula One promoting it, or is it the Verstappen effect, or is it just both? I think it's a combination. I think Liberty Media has done uh, a very good job on that side as well. Um, also, it's quite funny, but I was actually speaking to a um, uh, girl yesterday in the hotel, and she said that she started following Formula One because of TikTok. So, I mean, <laughs> I think there's, there's many ways how people get into um, watching Formula One. So, I think it's, it's, it's funny. Well, that sounds like um, Robert Schwartzman, who is a TikTok king, might be responsible for that sort of attention. Some of his videos <laughs> yeah, yeah. were <laughs> extremely funny. This one is for Charlie. It comes from Karina. Do you feel the burden of being the only Austrian on the horizon who might make it to Formula One? Um, well, myself, you know, I'm just focusing on doing the best I can in the car and also outside of the car. But um, yeah, I'm just focused on doing the job and the best I can. That's it, really, I think. I could tell that, Prem, I could tell that you've been having the PR stuff to give the, the right answers for this. <laughs> But let's let's talk it from the, the Verstappen point of view, though. Nationality is still important, right? That's the flag that flies and everything. Do you feel that as a like an extra pressure sort of thing? Do you feel like you, as we've had from Richard there, when you're looking for sponsors and people to back you, that hey, I'm the Austrian driver. I'm going to be the next Austrian kid who could make it to, a, to F1. Is that something you try and promote? Well, I've had some great sponsors helping me already this season um hopefully for the for the future as well but um yeah well my target is to be the next austrian f1 world champion and mm. that's what i'm working on right oh, we wish you the best with that this one comes from liam redford what has motivated richard to stay in f2 when he could possibly have moved to sports cars with less money like his old teammate Viscal? um well, I have a very, very clear goal in mind, and that's that I want to become Formula 2 champion. So that's my only reason. Well, that's my reason why I'm staying. I mean, I'm not... Of course, my goal is to be in Formula 1 one day, but I also understand that it will be very difficult to get there. Uh, and I'm sure that you need to become a Formula 2 champion before you can, um, unless you're already backed by a Formula 1 um, team, for example. Um, or your dad's a Russian oligarch. Exactly. But I mean, I mean, my goal as a as a boy is is to become a Formula Two champion. So. Well, that that answers that. I'm uh, I really am glad that you actually continued on this year from my from my own perspective, Richard. It was a a late call, but <laughs> you're becoming Very. an you're becoming a, a, an expert at these late calls. I feel because it was the same last year, wasn't it? You were like the last driver to be announced then as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just because of the budget, but uh, I'm not very proud of it. But uh, I hope it's different next year 
yeah, well, fingers crossed. Unless you win the championship this year and you just can't come back. Oh, this will be difficult if I look at it now, but it's still eight eight rounds to go, so you never know. You never know. Well, I'll tell you what, if you make that work, I'll be uh, yeah, that'll be something to something to see. This one's from 0711 Colchos, which is probably horribly mispronounced by me. He wants to ask Charlie, are there some downsides if you race in so many series? Of course, there are benefits, but maybe there's some things that also make it harder. And just before you answer, actually, Charlie, could you just give a bit of a explanation for people who might not be so familiar with you on everything you've raced in this year? Because it's, well, let's be honest, a shitload, I think, is a technical term. Yeah, so I think at the start of the year, I raced in the UAE. And then, so I did, after that, I did some testing to race the Italian championship and then do three rounds of the Germans. I have one more in Zandvoort. So that's, and as well, I raced one weekend um, as a replacement driver with Campos in Spain in Jerez, which was also cool in Formula 4. And yeah, so I've raced quite a lot. I think four championships this year, which is a lot of experience and very thankful for that. Um, but I mean, I think there's lots of positives of racing multiple championships also with different tires, working with different teams. You learn so much mm. how different people work. I think it's very helpful also for the future. Um, and I think there's mainly only positives of doing all of that, but you could say maybe a negative would be that it might take slightly longer to adjust if you would race from, let's say, the Hankook tire to the Pirelli one weekend to the next. If you only have one or two free practice sessions, it might take you slightly longer to adjust, but that wasn't an, really an issue, but maybe for some drivers it could be. But there are many positives of racing so much and I think I have a lot of experience under my belt now. This next question comes from Adzi via Discord. For you, Richard, do you feel more free of a driver the last few years away from the Red Bull junior team? Or if you had the chance, would you prefer to be an academy driver? And let's just say any academy. Um, not really. Uh, I just feel much more free now. I have my financial part shorted, let's say. So mm. uh, I think it was very good for me to be in Red Bull. I learned a lot there. I think... It, I think I just wasn't ready yet at that time. I was very young. Um, I think my main issue was as well that I had no um, really supportive people also around me. I, I never really had the, you know, I was always doing everything alone. Hmm. Um, so I, I'm a lot better than now. I learned a lot, but I think that's also why it took me a bit longer to yeah, become at the level where I want to be. And I think when I was uh, 15, 16, I wasn't there yet. So... I didn't feel more free when it dropped me, but clearly this season I do feel much more free when I have my funds sorted before the season starts. Do you think it's a situation like we've seen with like Bottas now, who's just coming to his own in F1 with Alfa Romeo, knowing he's got his seat sorted and Perez goes and what wins Monaco, if you believe the rumours, after signing the contract before, that you get that confidence to know what your future is and that makes a big difference on track? It's very important to know which direction you're going, like for what you're doing it at the moment. I mean, it's so much better if I would know that already now that I'm doing another season of F2, for example, that mm. it just gives rest um, for your mind. And I think that's very important for drivers. Let's move on to this question from AS19, Alex, part of the F1 Feeder Series, who wants to know, well, firstly, Charlie, will you be able to come to the Spa Media Centre around midday on Friday, but says, jokes aside, which type of car do you enjoy driving more, the F4 car or the Porsche GT4? I mean, they're both very different cars. Um, but um, yeah, I drove Porsche GT4 last year in Hungara Ring. And then also in Jeddah and Bahrain, which was uh, definitely a cool experience. And I want to thank Lechner Racing for that. But um, yeah, I mean, the the GT4 car is 1,400 kilos compared to the 600 kilos of Formula 4. So <laughs> it's completely different. But um, they were both quite fun to drive. But I would say the F4 is slightly faster, so it's slightly more fun. 
I would say maybe a GT3 is equally as fun or maybe a bit more fun because it has a lot more horsepower than Formula 4. So do, you think, do you think maybe when you ascend to Richard's Formula 2 levels or possibly beyond that you might have different answers when it comes down to that level of horsepower and power? Because that's one of the things that we've heard from other drivers is just you have so much more power but equally a bit more weight and the, the wheels have yeah. different characteristics that you might have different answers? Yeah, I'm sure. I, I think... F4 obviously is the first step into single seaters. So I think if you, when you progress, there'll be obviously more horsepower. So it'll be more fun to drive. Um, since yeah, F4, there's basically no very low power. So it's the straights feel so long. It's the tracks are a bit too big, I think, for, for F4. So, so it's different, but I think if you go up in categories, it'll be a lot more fun. You've been racing with Spar already this year, right? Haven't you? With the the Kevil Straight and stuff. That's a long time to be a flat. Yeah, I think it's like uh, forty seconds full throttle or something. How long's it? How long's it full throttle at uh, Baku, Richard? No idea. Oh, it's twenty five uh, seconds odd in Formula One. So I reckon for you guys it must be what thirty five, maybe thirty. Yeah, thirty maybe. Yeah. You sent a couple of tweets out there. <laughs> yeah, I could take a coffee, selling <laughs> coffee. I remember the drivers in the first went to back who were saying it was just like felt hilariously long. Is it like, do you start thinking of things? You get distracted just racing down that last straight? Yeah, well, the thing is, you come out of the last corner and then you have two very tricky ones for F2. It's not that easy flat in qualifying, it is, but in the race, definitely not. And then as soon as you come out of this last two corners, then you're waiting basically for DRS. So at that point, you're very focused. And then as soon as DRS, DRS opens, it's only like, I don't know maybe ten seconds until you're there, so it's it's a bit different as a feeling for a driver. It's not mm. that easy. It's just not thirty seconds going like that. Well, if, uh, I take it flat out in Formula One, uh, the, the video game. So I mean, you know, you can you can. Oh, it's it's exactly the same, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go on to the next question for you, Richard. Jake uh, wants to know, you've had your struggles with financial restrictions towards the end of last year. How difficult is it to be able to fund a seat, not just in F2, but any feeder series? And how do you think it can be improved? Uh, tricky question. I know. Uh, how, it be, in, how it can be improved. Of course, I have my ideas, but uh, I mean, in Formula One, there's so, so much money going around. Like it, It's like, even a different world compared to F2, which is already very, very expensive. I mean, for me, there should be a way how they can basically flew a bit of this money floating around there or the profits, or I don't know, um, towards the, the Formula 2 drivers or teams. Because at the moment, the, the prices for a seat in one season is, they're ridiculous. I mean, for people like me who have like, zero budget from home it's almost impossible to find the full budget uh, unless you have like an investor um, so it's, it's, it's just very difficult and then um, also I, I do everything myself so I don't have a manager so uh, some people also have to give a percentage to the managers or to the to the companies they're working with to find sponsors so it's just extremely difficult for yourself and at the moment I have 18 partners that support me financially so I also have to make sure they're all happy and I stay in touch with them. So it's definitely not easy, but uh, it's just a bit two sides of racing. And then on the sides, you do the, you do the sponsorship. So do you think you're wearing two caps all times? So you have to take your helmet off and become yeah. a businessman. I have oh, this one and this one. <laughs> <laughs> For the benefit of anybody listening, we just saw the Trident hat to go with his like, existing hat that's on his head. But it also says, are you having to go and be the businessman even like now when you've got, well, a couple of weeks off, fairly rare this year for you, at this, this summer at least. Now, do you have to go and shake hands, look for more sponsorship and so on? Is this something you're just constantly doing even when you're not racing? Especially now I send it in the wall again, so I have to uh, find more budget. Uh, that's also the thing. I mean, all the budgets we're talking about is excluding damages. And in an F2, it goes very quickly. So uh, on the other hand, I mean, it's not something you should think about. But I mean, there are drivers that don't have to care about it at all. So it's definitely a difference. And then, yeah, I have 18 partners, as I said. So, of course, it's not they just give me money and I, I race. I mean, I have to do th things in return, uh, which I will do, you know, with all the pleasure. But I will do track days in Zandvoort or any circuit where, where they want to. 
um, car clinics, uh, being at events from companies. Um, yeah, I have a very busy schedule also next to my racing stuff. Floris, you were on the podcast, weren't you, um, with Alistair Young, when we were talking about these sorts of cost things where, well, one, you could tell us, because I know it's always a sensitive subject, how much you remember the Formula 2 seat costing for, for the year, I think last year, I think you said it was a couple of million. But also, Alistair mentioned that thing about what Richard's alluding to here, potentially points deductions or something for some of the drivers who do, do crash because you do see some people like people potentially who aren't going to be racing next weekend who are crashing more regularly and that might cost other drivers who can't afford it more dearly than just financially because they're then losing points is that something you'd still support yeah i think so because um yeah i think it was alistair young who told me like some drivers just have to they, they can't even you know go on the limit all the time or they watch around them if competitors don't crash into them because uh because it's so expensive so that would be i guess one solution yeah um because and also like like richard said you don't want it to influence you and maybe it also doesn't but it's it's costly and the higher up you get the more it costs and what was the figure that you you plucked out before that you knew the last the formula two seat was costing because after I think you told me was it 4.5 million euros how much how much 4.5 was it 2.5 4.5 i don't know but i don't it's remember something like now i, th I think we can, it can better, better ask richard <laughs> what it costs i think like two three million maybe for a top seat yeah something <laughs> like that yeah <laughs> I, I I will not say the exact amount, but it's it will be definitely if you want to be in the top team, just above two million, I think. Not not four point five. That's a bit. No, nah, yeah. But, I mean, uh, maybe maybe it's for both the seats, uh, and that's euros we're talking here, Richard. Yeah. Charlie, do you have two million euros floating around ready for your Formula Two campaign? Um, no, but I can maybe rob a bank. I <laughs> <laughs> got that line. <laughs> probably the best idea but um yeah i think it's not easy in motorsports with all the money but um oh uh, i think we have to do the best we can as a family to mm. to get the funding and work well with sponsors so you could have just instead just been born into a billionaire's family it would have been far easier for both of you guys but the next question actually comes about family because Ferdy Sailing via Instagram wants to know what is Charlie's, who is Charlie's, favorite Austrian racing driver, his dad or somebody else? Well, I mean, I do like my dad. <laughs> I'll, I'll say that. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think uh, there are many very good Austrian drivers, not mm. that many Austrian drivers in the end, but a few very good ones like let's say Nicky Lauda or something I think he's one of my inspirations he was a very strong driver I wasn't alive when he was racing so I don't know that much but I, I saw some and I heard stories and saw some videos obviously so so it's cool have you were you a do you remember your dad racing actually is that something that you distinctly remember watching him racing in F1 I only really remember sort of his last race in WEC, which was 2015. So when I started karting. Mm. Um, and that's all I really remember, to be honest. Before that, like when he was in, when he was in F1, I don't, don't have any memories of that. I was just looking actually into his uh, season. So 2007, his last F1 season. And you were born in what? I dread to ask this question, Charlie. You were born December in 2000. 2005. Make me a florist feel real old. So yeah, you'd be, be impressive if you did remember that. But yeah. I remember. I remember the podiums. Um, big fan of big fan of Alex Verts. Let's go on to this question. Oh, it looks like you're the financial expert here with this question AS from AS19 for you, Richard. Could you please fully break down, not just break down, fully break down the costs of a season in European karting? Let's go with a rough thing. How much? Because we're talking millions for Formula 2. It's not cheap in karting either. I know it's been a couple no. of years since you were racing, but what sort of level, not anything specific, what sort of level of funding are you looking at for a season in karts? Yeah, it, it depends a bit how crazy you want to make it. I mean, of course, you, you can do 12 races, but 
also you can do like I did I did 32 races when I did uh, Malaysia in karting so but it's just it's always so much more than people think first of all the the cost per race I think it's above 10k a, a lot above 10k race uh, and then of course you have your, your travels you have your hotels you have damages you have uh, there, there's always so much more uh, even for example food if you add everything up over one full season it's incredible how much you spend on on drinks and food i mean it's just i think for for a season in in karting at the highest level so let's say okay at the moment it's like a very popular category i think people are paying definitely more than 250 to 300k a year in euros so that's actually on well, nowadays not anymore but when i went from karting to formula four i was uh, my season in formula four was cheaper than my season in karting well that's is that just from the number of races you were doing? Yeah, and at that time, Formula 4 was cheaper than the championship I was doing. Nowadays, I think it's also more expensive uh, since the new cars arrived. But uh, yeah, karting was just ridiculous. For the benefit of those listening, not watching, there was a knowing nod from Charlie there about the new cars and the costs. So yeah, we're, we're all very aware of the cost, but I, I really appreciate Richard you breaking it down that much because that's the sort of thing that's quite difficult for us to see as fans. Is we know it's expensive, but it's so opaque to know if it's ten k a race, fifty k a race, etc. Yeah. On these different. No, but also you have to. You always have someone with you. I mean, if you're fourteen or thirteen, you cannot travel alone. Mm. So either if it's your dad, and then you also have like a mechanic or a coach, and like he he doesn't go for free neither. So I mean, it it all adds. Up. so you're paying for the salaries of those people plus then their food their travel their accommodation exactly, exactly. yeah yeah we're gonna rob that bank now charlie i think that's the best thing for you this next question comes from laura bushel for you as well charlie on instagram what was it like to win the f4 uae and has it given you more confidence going into this season i imagine it must have been pretty damn good yeah, it was it was nice. Obviously, I think my, well, my first championship in car racing or Formula Four, as you like to call it, um, to win it was was great, and also to have my family there in the end, the last race, um, was nice. And yeah, the team worked very hard, and we had a strong package, worked well together, and were quite consistent over the rounds, so we were able to to get the win, which was nice, and. Yeah, it gave me a bit more confidence going into the the next races in, in Italy and Germany as well. Do you think you'd have gone into the ADAC and Italian F4 championships with such, I don't know how to use it, like such um, momentum, I guess, without having that winter series? Because that's, you've been racing a little bit last year, you've done a lot more racing this year, but do you think that's really helped you? Has it been beneficial? Has it been... Um, I don't know the right word, uh, applicable, look at the car and everything for you racing in Italian and F, Italian and ADEC F4 this year? Yeah, I think it was very important for a lot of the drivers in the UAE because we learned, especially even the teams, we learned so much about the new cars. They're quite different to the mm. old ones. So basically everything is different. The size, the power, the weight. Um, so it's quite also different to drive and so it was a very good experience. We, we could test different setups and everything. So we were more ready going into the Italian and the German championship. The only thing that was different was the tires and obviously the track temperature since in the way <laughs> it's quite hot compared to here. Um, but yeah, it was a really good experience, I think, for the teams and also the drivers in the UAE, in the UAE to prepare for, for the European season. Yeah, I've heard that the Middle East and Europe have quite different weather patterns, so that does make sense. Glad that you could confirm that. This one, I think you kind of answered it already, actually, Richard. This is from Vijas, T-H-I-J-S, however you pronounce that. Vijas, do you see no, yourself... It's, it's Thais. It's Thais. Oh, is, that, is that Dutch? It's a Dutch name, yeah. But how, say, how do you say it? Thais. Thais. What's the J? Yeah, Thais. Where, where's the J? Yeah, no, it's 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 a, it's a Y. Thais. Yeah. Thais. Okay. The okay. beautiful Dutch uh, language. Yeah. Really. Yeah. <laughs> 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 That's what everybody listening is hearing. 
<laughs> <laughs> this question is from Thighs. Do you see yourself doing another season in F2 or do you want to move on after this season? Now, we've spoken about that already. So, assuming Felipe Drogovic wins the championship, are you looking to do this next season as well? Uh, first, I never wanted to do it more than two years. But if I look at it now, also Felipe, uh, going to Joe last season. Um, yeah, I think it's very val- valuable also for the teams to have an experienced driver. Uh, and myself, mm-hmm. as I said, my main goal is to win a championship. So, yeah, if not this season, uh, I think I want to try again. Is that but, the first time that we've... Is that an exclusive? Have we got the exclusive there that for sure is going to be back next Well, year? anyone that has asked me, I've said the same answer, but on online, yes, uh, it's the first time. But anyway, I have to find the budget. So uh, mm-hmm. it will definitely not... It's not a, um, that I want it. doesn't mean that it will happen, let's say. Mm. But you are thinking of that at the moment because you do want that F2 championship to your name. Yeah. Well, I'm delighted should you find the budget and I guess the drive to survive and Max Verstappen effect will help you even more as the sport grows. So I wish you well in that. It'll be great to see you back next year. This one, talking next year, this one's from Amadeo1204 for Charlie. Is Charlie planning to run in multiple F4 championships next year or if possible, take a step to F3? I think we haven't made any plans yet and we still have a bit of time till the end of the year, but I think the plan is to move on. Mm. Um, either I think the two main options are to go to Formula Regional or straight to FIU Formula 3. And yeah, we'll have to see. I, I don't really know, to be honest, at the moment what I'm going to do. Mm. Just focused on this year and doing the best I can. And then after, I think we'll see for the rest and my parents will do the do the deals, organize that, and and yeah. You get Richard Vashor as your manager. He knows exactly what to do with all the deals. But I'm busy for myself. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, Charlie, with that, is there anything you have to like speak to? Is I presume Pramer and stuff that like is there a deadline when you have to make these decisions by, and what, is that approaching soon? I have no idea. So. Oh, that's yeah, nice. I don't. I don't really know. I think my parents have done most of the deals. I, I'm not there for the deals, so I, I don't know. I think obviously not too late, but um, yeah, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. I don't know. How about that? Richard's just uh, in disbelief that you don't know all these answers. With uh... exactly, <laughs> you can see I mean, it's actually wide strange eyes. Strange that some people don't. I mean, for me, it's so normal that. I know, like, I sign the contracts myself, even for my sponsors or for the team. So I know everything. I, I know exactly what's in the contract or when the negotiations start. They're already in, in, in process now for some teams, also for Formula 2. So it's, everything starts so early in those days. Yeah. I was speaking to uh, an unknown source who was saying that there were some drivers who were looking at their next championship season by April. And I'm thinking the season hasn't even started and you're already making those kind of calls and those discussions and basically writing off if they're going to win Formula 3, Formula 2 or whatever championship. It's just nuts. Uh, We're running long, but I'm going to ask this final question. I just need to find it. Uh, uh, This one from Lena RV20. (laughs) Whose Twitter handle is Vashorni. Isn't that nice? But this is really important, and it goes on. Let's say all three of you actually keep you and this is Floris. Which do you pour first, cereal or milk? Let's go with you, Richard, seeing as the username is for you. When you make your cereal, do you put the cereal in first or the milk in first? Really important stuff. Well, uh, when I'm in Italy, I put the cereal first and then the milk. In in Netherlands, I put first the milk and then the cereal. Yeah, when I do it myself. I put in the, the milk first. Is this a thing? Do you do changes from country? No, but in, in uh, Italy, they, they basically they make it for me. <laughs> this podcast is a wealth of knowledge. <laughs> Charlie, when you make it yourself, or maybe you get your parents to make it for you, is it the cereal or the milk goes in first? Um, I'm a bit strange, so I have my cereal without milk. What? Um, <laughs> Just plain cereal. I don't know. It's a bit strange, but um, I've never heard that before. <laughs> I have 
like uh, granola and I put a bit of honey like with it. So, but if I would have to say, I would say like um, cereal and then milk. Yeah. Well, I mean, the granola makes it slightly better because otherwise you're just eating like cornflakes like a madman. But... <laughs> Loris, do just give some sensibility at the end of this podcast, please. Well, it, it's I can confirm it's not a Dutch thing because I put in cereal first. Mm-hmm, correct. That way, you know, you can you can measure how much cereal you put in your bowl. Do you know what? Lane has asked this question. We kind of laughed at it, but I feel we've had we've le- we've all learned something here, haven't we? About how <laughs> ridiculous some people eat their cereals and what some countries do and uh, jim um can i ask you the same question no i, I said i said you did the correct way it has to be cereal first but it, otherwise well you're going to be eating it with your hands like a madman but, soon, like charlie <laughs> go, on, Actually, go on richard you've got some something to say it's when i think about it it sounds weird when you put the milk first but it's because i always eat quark so it's like ah. it, it's different yeah that's true Eat quark, did you say? Yeah, is it a strange word? I it's don't like know. Yogurt. U U A R K. Sorry, yeah, it's, I think it's a Dutch word. Quark. <laughs> oh yeah, quark is a dairy Co- product. Cheese, but that doesn't sound right. No, no. Okay, let's say yogurt. Yogurt. Okay, because yeah. I'm I'm looking at these pictures, which I'll throw up on the screen now if you're watching on YouTube, and it looks like yeah, cream cheese, which that does not go with cereal. That is no, it's just yogurt with more protein, basically. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. So you basically say you put yogurt in, and then you just starting to sprinkle some stuff to to flavor exactly. the yogurt up. Okay, that's acceptable. Am who I less knew? Weird now? No, no, it's less weird now. But who knew that such a <laughs> an innocent question would <laughs> give such wild answers? Um, you really amazed. threw Jim off. It's it's unbelievable. Jim is <laughs> out of his element. Yeah. <laughs> Take me off cars and I'm lost. Thank Five you very simple, much. Five uh, simple letters. Thank you very much, Lady. That was a brilliant question. And uh, congratulations on the Vashorni um, Twitter handle. That's brilliant. We're going to have to call it a day here. Uh, I'm afraid that's all the time we have this week. Thank you, everybody, for watching and listening. And if you'd like to have your question asked on a future episode, use the hashtag AskF1FS on Twitter. Drop any questions below if you're watching on YouTube. Or let us know what questions you have on your mind on our Discord. Look for the podcast questions channel. If you're watching on YouTube, dropping a like on the video, leaving a comment and subscribing to the channel all really helps us out on our push to 1000. And if you're listening, leaving a review on the podcast platform you're listening on is greatly appreciated, unless it's one star. I want five stars on Spotify. Come on, guys. Finally, check out F1FeederSeries.com for more Feeder Series insight and follow F1 Feeder Series 1, F1 FS Americas and F1 FS Live on Twitter. You can find the links to all of those plus the Twitter accounts for myself and everyone else on the podcast in the YouTube description or the podcast show notes. Until next time, we have been the F1 Feeder Series podcast. Goodbye.